In the world where we remember people like Sam Colt or John Browning, Melvin Maynard Johnson doesn't immediately jump to mind as one of the great technical innovators in American firearms design history, but he certainly was, was that. Johnson was a captain in the Marine Corps Reserve, which probably gave him some experience with firearms that the average Boston lawyer wouldn't have. And while he was in law school, he decided he wanted to design his own semi-automatic rifle because when the M1 Garand was adopted in 1936, Johnson felt it was a badly flawed weapon for a lot of reasons. So he embarked on a quest to design what he felt would be a much superior rifle. So he develops this rifle all on his own. They have a couple of these prototypes made by a company in Cranston, Rhode Island. Interesting part is, unlike the Garand, which is a, a gas operated, the Johnson works on a short recoil principle where the actual barrel recoils up against the bolt. The bolt comes back part of the way and at that pressure point where the bullet's finally out of the barrel, it's safe to unlock, then it unlocks it goes, and then goes back into battery. The military really wasn't interested in the new same automatic rifle because it just adopted the M1. But as a courtesy to Johnson and his family, they gave it a cursory test and then they dismissed it. Well, that didn't suit Johnson. He decided that he would bring some political pressure that his family had, and it ultimately resulted in congressional hearings being held to determine whether the Johnson rifle or the Grand was superior. The Johnson rifle was a 10-shot semi-auto, whereas the M1 Garand was a, an 8-shot semi-auto. The Johnson rifle fed from a rotary magazine. You could top it off, so if you loaded 10 rounds and shot 5, you could pull out 5 single shots and top it off. This is something that you could not do with the M1 Garand rifle. The Johnson rifle also had the added benefit of being able to remove the barrel to make it compact, in other words, ideal for airborne operations, so ideal for parachute forces. It really didn't make any difference. There was really no chance that the Johnson was going to supplant the Garand. There were just too many Ordnance Department careers at stake. The only campaign where the Johnson rifle saw actual combat was on Bougainville. With one exception, there were 23 Johnson rifles lent to the Marine Corps by Melvin Johnson and they did see action on Guadalcanal. The bolt of the M1941 Johnson rifle, it contains a radially organized locking lugs, and he created it like this so that one would not have to go through the overall rotation that you had to on a bolt action rifle like the M1903. That instead, you could have multiple locking lugs around the face of a bolt that as they moved into battery, they could rotate through less of an arc to get a full lockup on the bolt, the bolt to the barrel. This would translate itself into another design a little bit further on down the line in the 1950s um, in the form of a firearm developed by the Armalite Division of Fairchild Aircraft, the AR-10 which would ultimately become the AR-15, which would ultimately become the M-16, which would ultimately become the M-4. And so in this very interesting way, with Melvin Maynard Johnson's designs during the Second World War, we begin a lineage that starts there and continues all the way through the warfare of Vietnam and pushes on beyond that to warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan in the 21st century. But Melvin Maynard Johnson Jr. did not stop there. He continued to design other automatic weapons. From his company in Cranston, Rhode Island, right outside of Providence, he also would ultimately design a very effective light machine gun. A light machine gun that is not exactly the most well-known of American World War II firearms design, but a firearm that did see combat nevertheless. I give the man uh, enormous credit as a visionary. He was a visionary. He was a, a, he was an inventor. He was a tactician. He was a man who recognized the need for his light machine gun and the tactical role that it might play. Uh, long before the United States Army recognized it worked on the same principles as the rifle. 
It was fed by a, a single stack magazine. It was lateral, it was curved, and loaded in from the left hand side. And this machine gun later becomes really a sought after weapon in the early days of the Pacific War and World War II. Want to know what's happening at American Rifleman? Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. We'll be right back. Elite units of the United States Marine Corps, in particular the parachutists, used the Johnson model of 1941 rifle. But also, really, the unit in the U.S. Army that is the father of all special forces uh, used Johnson model of 1941 light machine guns, and that unit was the first special service force. You have to remember that these guys were expected to parachute and ski. And that's where the Johnson model of 1941 light machine gun comes in. The First Special Service Force was joint Canadian and American. Uh, the Canadians had to give up their Bren guns, and the Americans had to give up their BARs. And the gun they got was the Johnson light machine gun. One big advantage of the Johnson light machine gun over the BAR, which it was intended to replace or at least supplement, was its much lighter weight. The BAR weighed about 20 pounds, while the Johnson light machine gun weighed about 12 pounds. So the Johnson light machine gun, feeding from a detachable box magazine, a box magazine that does not have its own feed lips, but feed lips that live inside the gun itself. A firearm that fired from the open bolt that was select fire. A firearm that looked very modernistic in every respect of the word. The Johnson light machine gun was also not where Melvin Maynard Johnson stopped. While Johnson was developing the light machine gun and semi-automatic rifle for the Dutch government, he thought that perhaps they might be interested in a carbine type weapon because the East Indies troops were typically shorter and weighed less than the average American soldier and he thought that a weapon that was shorter and lighter might appeal to the Dutch. He produced four auto carbines, which were essentially a cross between the light machine gun and the Johnson semi-automatic rifle. The auto carbine was called Daisy May. It was a semi-automatic weapon. It had the same barrel as the light machine gun, but had the 10 round rotor magazine like the Johnson rifle did. There were only five made. There's only one known to be in private hands. And I think it's unfortunate the United States military really didn't see the need for that weapon because I think it really could have been an ace weapon of the war had it been developed more. It really wasn't much bigger than a M1 carbine. It certainly weighed more, but it weighed less than the M1 rifle or the Johnson rifle, and it fired the powerful 30-06 cartridge. So I think it combined compactness and lightweight with firepower. But again, it's just a footnote to military history now, but it's a thoroughly unique and thoroughly interesting weapon. His innovations and his technical acumen and genius for firearms design continued beyond that. He then ultimately turns to the M1 carbine, the M1 carbine which had been made in such abundant numbers during the Second World War and made in a cartridge that Melvin Maynard Johnson felt could be improved upon. And so what Melvin Maynard Johnson did was he took the existing M1 carbine, he developed a Wildcat cartridge for it, the 5.7 by 33 millimeter MMJ, standing for Melvin Maynard Johnson. He designed this special carbine and called it the Spitfire. And with M1 carbines rebarreled to 5.7 by 33 millimeter MMJ or Spitfire, he took the M1 carbine and turned it into something that performed a lot like the M16. In other words, he produced with an existing M1 carbine, a firearm that fired flat trajectory, high velocity. And the best news of all is that the Johnson Spitfire, had it been adopted by the American military, it would have made logistics quite easy because the Johnson Spitfire carbine fired the 5.7 by 33 millimeter cartridge from the existing M1 carbine magazine. No modifications necessary. But some of Melvin Maynard Johnson Jr.'s most interesting and pioneering work uh, was done in an evaluation that he did of multi-barrel rotating aircraft cannons. He simply took existing Gatling guns in 4570, in other words, metallic cartridge firing Gatling guns, 
um, hooked them up to an electric motor and found that he could reach these really amazing, these staggering cyclic rates of fire, thousands of rounds per minute. And that pioneering work in the long run would turn into the developments that would ultimately take us to the Vulcan Gatling gun that's, that's, that saw so much prolific use during the Vietnam War and is a weapon still being used to this very day, a weapon that arms helicopters, that arms fighter aircraft, that arms practically everything. And although Johnson didn't get the credit for it, Johnson did much of the early pioneering work of attaching electric motors to multiple rotating barrels. And so in so many ways, this man was ahead of his time in imagining a future, in imagining sleek, modernistic small arms designs. We lost him in 1965, and if we had not lost him then, one can only imagine the type of brilliant, informed, and inspired designs he would have offered up. He was a man who was ahead of his time in every way.